Good evening, friends, and welcome to another edition of Crime Time with Duty Ron and Ed Wallace. We are retired New York City police detectives and 9-11 World Trade Center first responders. If you like all things true crime related from the police detective's perspective, consider hitting that subscribe button, hit that notification bell, so you'll get all things Duty Ron and, hold on a second, this guy, Ed Wallace, when we go live or upload another video. I knew something was wrong, Ed. Uh, tonight we have a case that we've been waiting to talk about for the past three or so weeks. Uh, the three Kansas City Chief fans who were found dead in their friend's backyard on Sunday. The, the, the watch party was Sunday, the 7th of January. They were found two days later by one of the victim's fiancés in the backyard, either frozen to death or died from a drug overdose. We're not sure exactly how this happened because the science is what's going to tell us what happened to them. And we're going to get into that in a few minutes, Ed. Uh, but before we do, we want to say thank you to your the, the replay viewers, the Patreon supporters, the moderators, the folks who subscribe and leave us comments, super thanks, super chats, and cups of coffee on the Buy Me a Cup of Coffee app. You guys are what makes us a great place. We give thanks and praise to you. You guys are second to none. But tonight, you know, we're going to dive into what we know. And what we know right now is not a whole heck of a lot. The tox report has come back and the family has kind of leaked some of the information in that tox report. And it is kind of um, these reports, Ed, are very detailed and there's a lot of big words in them. So it's easy to kind of misconstrue things, but we do know that there are three substances uh, potentially in these reports that were put out there. But I wanted to get your thoughts on it as a seasoned crime scene investigator. You know, heck, what what would you do if you got this call and you came up on the scene, you got three um, adults in a backyard, and I'm going to read their names out. David Harrington, 37, Ricky Johnson, 38, and Clayton McGinney, 36 years old. These are relatively young men um, frozen in the backyard. It's a, it's a difficult one. Absolutely. Uh, absent any uh, injuries or, you know, blunt force trauma, stab wounds, um, shooting, and you have three deceased middle-aged male whites on the ground, frozen, the, basically frozen in the backyard. All right. Um, Absent any of those other signs of trauma or any signs of struggle or any signs of an attack or an assault, you know, it, it, it right away, the first thing that's going to come, okay, when you get the background story, or they were here at the, you know, partying at a football game, you know, watching the football game and partying in the house, and they've been lifelong friends from high school on and so forth. Um, right away, you, I'm, I'm going to think that as well. I mean, we had, we had uh, Keith Ledger, we had... Um, uh, Seymour, what was his name? Uh, Hoffman Seymour, uh, um, the actors, these two, these big actors, uh, who did these types of things and in Manhattan and so forth and ended up dead, uh, uh, you know, overdosing because of this John Belushi. Yeah. When and you, the actor from friends too, recently, right. right. He found in his bathtub, he drowned from past well, well, overdose. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, Whitney Houston and then Whitney's daughter, same, same scenarios, but, but getting back to John Belushi, when you mix a, an opioid with cocaine and, you know, in the, depending on the dose, you know, you could the speedball, as they call it. In this case, you know, we, we have similar drugs going on here. Um, so it isn't beyond the realm that, uh, you know, during, they partied and the, the, they overdosed on the cocaine and fentanyl mixture. You know, what's really making this uh, situation complex and what's making it very, very um, suspicious and suspect to most who are watching this is that the two-day blackout is what changed this whole complexity of this whole case because you have the home renter. He's not a homeowner. You have the home renter, uh, Jordan Willis, 38 years old. Uh, he is a PhD, uh, some type of scientist where he is um, doing experimental or coming up with, you know, uh, 
working for, I, I don't even know. We don't even know where he was working for, but it was something to do with the HIV drug and his friends going on News Nation and various outlets saying that, hey, we know about this guy. He always concocts uh, 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 drugs for people to make them feel better. He's the guy. We're going to listen to some of the uh, some of the testimonies, some of the people that are talking about this guy. And for him to go just shut down for two whole days, Ed, that's what makes this whole thing get into a whirlwind and everybody starts saying, wait a minute, it's him. It's well, him. well, I, I, I disagree. What if they all took the same thing and he stayed in the house where it was warm and the others uh, started to feel overheated um, because if you take too much cocaine, your body can overheat. And in addition, the cocaine, not only does it cause you to overheat, your, it also inhibits your body's mechanisms that allow you to cool down, mm. okay? So co cocaine will raise your body temperature if you take too much of it. And then in addition, it'll change your body's mechanisms and it won't allow itself to cool down, Right. okay? Uh, so think about this, right? If they're partying and um, these guys uh, heat up, okay, the one guy... He goes to bed around 10 -ish. Uh, He crashes for two days, right? And then he, the others, they go outside to cool down. One guy is actually sitting in um, on the porch in a chair, and the others are laying on the on the ground in on close proximity. Yeah, on in the close proximity proximity to each other. Okay, so they go out there, and um, because they're out there, they when they pass out, they get hypothermia, and they end up freezing uh, and probably cardiac arrest right. occurs. Or here's another scenario. The way people, most people die from opioids, or especially the synthetics, the you know, fentanyl, carfentanyl, and so forth, is if you take too much of any of that, if you take too much oxy, if you take too much um, codeine, you take too much of any of those, it paralyzes your lungs and you asphyxiate. First, you start to get... Um, Cyanosis, which is the bluing of the skin because your blood is not accepting the oxygen, okay? And those are some of the signs. In fact, uh, we're going to show you, folks, um, some of the signs and symptoms of overdosing on both uh, right. cocaine, which is a stimulant, and then um, the synthetic opioid fentanyl. Yeah. Hey, I want to highlight this comment because, again, I pointed out that he was a renter and not a homeowner, but it, it, it was just... To, for clarification, because people already are questioning who owns that home. You know, right away they want to try to say, oh, you know, let's go and ask the homeowner about this, about the occupant. We know uh, through the reporting, through the reporting that, again, this occupant of this home, it was a renter. And it, that was all uh, the only reason why we, we, we put that out there is because, you know, people already or like I said, or, or saying to, to, you know, out in, in, in Twitter and up on Facebook and on TikTok, who owns that home? Let's go and ask the homeowner. I, I, could be a property that's bought by someone that's using as a, a rental income, right? He's has a, a real estate company that's, um, you know, leasing it out or whatever they're doing. Who knows? It, do, it doesn't matter. We're just putting out that information. Let's play this little piece by, uh, Cuomo and News Nation, because this was uh, earlier tonight, and this will give you guys a little bit of a overview on what's what's going on. All right, let's start with what matters here. Breaking news, okay? We now know what killed these three men in Kansas City. How it happened? Whom else might be in danger? Those are the questions, but this is certainly not over. All right, so what do we know? Three young men in their 30s found dead in the backyard of a friend who survived. Didn't make sense. Why? No sign of foul play, one of them upright in a chair, one of them without a coat, frozen in the cold. Didn't make sense until you see the blood. Let's go to News Nation's national correspondent, Alex Capriello in Kansas City, Missouri, for the latest. It's a big scoop. What do you know? Yeah, big scoop and certainly unexpected. We were told that these toxicology reports would not come back for at least another three to five weeks, but little did we know that they would be delivered to the families, at least the information that was within inside of them to the families. Basically, what I've heard from my sources who are connected to these families tell me that detectives from KCPD called them, told them that the 
preliminary toxicology reports have come back to their desk and it shows that there was a mixture of cocaine, fentanyl, and THC, also known as marijuana, that was in their systems. Now, the families themselves have not actually had new copies of these toxicology reports. I think that's still gonna take some time, but I think this is what you've been alluding to for the past couple of days. These families deserve at least some sort of closure, some sort of answers, and it appears that KCPD did that today. So Alex, in, oh, good. Jordan's a chemist. They all knew him as that. It was easy for them to go have fun, but he <laughs> up. He made a mistake. Jordan is somebody that is known from high school as like creating drugs for people to make them feel better in certain situations. Okay, well, you want to do this? Okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna make this for you. I'm gonna make. So that's what I was talking about, Ed. The, you know, this is one of family members of one of the decedents, and he said that he, Jordan, is known to make concoctions for people if they're not feeling right. Hey, I'm gonna make this for you. Um, well, here, here's the problem with that. Okay. The police didn't get a warrant, but they got his consent. And you would think, okay, they're going to search the house. Okay. Yeah. If they got his consent, they said they didn't need a warrant because he gave us consent. And apparently he had a lawyer too. Um, but he yeah, they went up. through his house. So did they find any laboratories that would be producing um, fentanyl? Because you're not, you're not producing cocaine, yeah. right? Unless, you know, you, you got the raw coca. I don't think so. You're buying that as a powder. Okay. Yeah. And today... You're buying powdered cocaine, powdered heroin off the streets or whoever knows where the source is. They're mixing it with fentanyl, right? Here yeah. in New York City, we have free vending machines all over the city that the city has placed out there so that these these um, you can get Narcam out of the machine for free. All you have to do is put your uh, your zip code in and uh, some basic information into the into the um, vending machine and it'll spit out some Narcam. It'll also spit out some test strips for fentanyl. And it tells you how to test your drugs before you take it to make sure there's no fentanyl in here. That's Which, crazy. You know, it's just crazy. Ed. And, you know, drugs at any time, whether it was the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, it, drugs are never a good thing to take because you don't know who's mixing it. It's not regulated. It's, uh, you know, done in dirty areas. It's done to maximize income and profit. Uh, and and it's now nowadays mixed with uh, fentanyl. And... As we know, that that is a killer. We've seen body cam footage of police who have just breathed in while testing fentanyl and been knocked out, uh, out cold. Uh, mm -hmm. and, and some have survived and some haven't. So it's a very, very dangerous thing. And yeah, I, I don't think anybody held these three down and said, you have to do these drugs or, you know, but none of us were there. Nobody knows exactly what happened because dead men don't tell tales, right? Well, uh, they do. Well, in we're getting, toxicology yeah. and autopsy, right. you're going to see. Exactly, with the science. And that's Ooh. where, um, I mean, I, I use Barbara Butcher's uh, book line, uh, you know, only the dead know. Or, uh, but it, it, it's true. The the science and, and what happens with the forensic pathologist and with the tox reports, the, it's going to tell the tale. But again, uh, all of us sitting and speculating, nobody, nobody, but the people who are there know what happened and it's going to be up to the science. So I'm going to let the rest of this play because it's almost over. Better in certain situations. Okay. Well, uh, you want to do this? Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to make this for you. I'm going to make this for you. I'm going to make this for you and handing them out. So Alex, um, look, this is this guy's opinion. He is from the community. He may know, uh, this guy, Jordan, you know, this is going to be part of the investigation. Uh, but what's the word from the families about what this means to them and what they want next? I mean, every single family member that I've spoken to say that they're still devastated. This is still an unexpected death to befall their family. But it is a sense of relief that they are getting some sense of answers moving right. forward. Yesterday was the first step, just meeting with the Platte County prosecutor, knowing that an investigation is indeed going on. Now, they're no closer to a finale or a wrap of this investigation, but they met with the prosecutor. Now, then very next day, they get some preliminary results from a toxicology report. And so I think it is heading in the right direction, and that brings them some sense of relief. Hey, thank you for watching. So I don't know go. what killed these three men in um, Kansas City. I mean, look, there's so many different reports out there. I mean, I have a ton of different videos that I've saved here and then I looked at. 
but at the end of the day, um, what what's going to matter most, as you said, Ed, is the science. You want to just expand a little bit on that for some of the friends that are watching? Yeah. So they already did the um, they already did the toxicology. So most likely they took vitreous fluids from the eyes and some blood throughout the body, and um, they did their testing and they they found the drugs and they quantified the drugs. So they know that at least three separate types of drugs plus alcohol, right? So they have their fentanyl. They have and and the fentanyl is uh, three times. Um, Three times uh, what what could uh, you know the amount that could kill a person. Um, now also the uh, cocaine and then the marijuana. I mean, so you're mixing stimulants, you're mixing uh, hallucinogenic, uh, and you're mixing an opioid, which is never good, and alcohol. All of that's there. And at autopsy, if they looked at the eyes and they found particular hemorrhaging, what is that? Pinpoint red blood dots on the eyeballs or in on the eyelids okay and then in the lips on the inside of the lips if you see this is where the tiny when you're starving the, the body of oxygen this is when these tiny capillaries burst and create a, these particular hemorrhaging if they see that okay well then they can say okay he, he was probably overdosing on the fentanyl because the fentanyl paralyzes the lungs and stops you from breathing okay um but if they don't see that, so maybe they didn't um, ov overdose, but rather just passed out. Okay. Mm -hmm. But then if they find the other symptoms, uh, um, you know, the other signs in the body from cocaine overdose. Okay. Um, and maybe we can bring some of that stuff up now, Ron. Um, I wanted to just play really quick before we go into okay. that, Ed. I have a... Um... I have a small clip from the uh, anesthesiologist, and he talks a little bit about fentanyl before we go into that. Um, I, I just want to play this. This is only like three minutes. So I'm going to let it rip. And this is um, News Nation, again, asking a um, an anesthesiologist what his thoughts are on the potential for the use of cocaine and fentanyl together and any other drugs. And he says some pretty interesting stuff. And actually, he said a lot of what you just said, Ed. So I'm just going to let this play. Uh, and then we'll take some questions and we'll go into um, what you want to do here, uh, because there's a lot to unpack. Physiology at California Pacific Medical Center. Dr. Swisher, thanks so much for joining us. So we're still awaiting what the results of these toxicology reports are. We heard possibly cocaine. There's a lot of people who've been focusing on the possibility of fentanyl because these three appear to have just walked outside. One was found sitting in a lawn chair. How quickly would a fentanyl overdose happen in a person? Well, fentanyl is one of those medications which gets a lot of news because unfortunately there's a lot of misinformation about fentanyl uh, and how it's used and how it's ingested. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of substances that are bought on the street are contaminated with fentanyl either purposefully or not purposefully and people don't know that they're taking it. Uh, fentanyl is a narcotic. Um, it's a short acting, very potent narcotic. It's uh, much more potent than morphine or heroin is. Um, and uh, fentanyl, depending on the route of, by which it's ingested, can you know, work immediately, or if it's ingested orally, it can take a, sh a longer time to, to, um, to um, take effect. Right. So you know, we're speculating as to whether fentanyl is in there or not, but you don't have to have fentanyl. Uh, it could have been, like, you hear poly substance abuse, and if you look at uh, Heath Ledger, or you look at um, Matthew Perry, or Whitney Houston, or Tom Petty, or Prince, all these people, were engaging in poly substance abuse. And poly substance meaning they were taking a lot of things. There wasn't just correct. one thing found in their sure. system. Exactly, Ativan, Ambien, um, you know, cocaine. Ketamine. Um, ketamine, uh, in the case of Matt Perry, exactly. Just keep in mind that even though they said that the cause of death of Matthew Perry was ketamine, Matthew Perry fell asleep in a hot tub because of ketamine and he drowned. Right. Um, not that the ketamine is what killed him, but it was the proximate cause of his death. So that leads me to this question. The fourth man who was renting the house, named Jordan Willis, uh, says he yeah. spent two days sleeping on the couch. He has now reportedly right. checked himself into rehab, saying that this whole experience has been a, quote, wake-up call. Could he right. also have been suffering from the same effects of whatever drug or drugs the three victims who, who died took? They just happened to be outside when they succumbed, and he was fortunate enough to be inside and not in freezing cold? 
Yeah, exactly. I mean, unfortunately, these medications are essentially anesthetics. It's what I do for a living. I mean, that you give people enough anesthetics and they'll fall asleep. Uh, and these drugs are additive in their effect. And so, again, similar to Matthew Perry, he didn't die necessarily because of the ketamine. He died because he drowned in a hot tub. These men died because they fell asleep in sub-zero temperatures and they developed hypothermia and froze to death. So that's the, you know, the cause of death is hypothermia, but as a result of intoxication with multi-substances, which caused them to stop breathing, fall asleep, the whole, essentially. The whole group had been partying and watching the football game together leading up to this. Neighbors say they saw the men going into the house with uh, two 30 packs of beer. Um, yeah. Could alcohol also have played a role in all this? Absolutely. I mean, alcohol alone uh, could have played a role in this. If you drink enough, uh, you will fall asleep. And uh, um, and so they, it, it's just it, intoxication to the extent where you pass out and you do that in, again, sub-zero temperatures. I'm sure that's happened you know, many times in history. Uh, fishermen or people out in the cold fall asleep from drinking too much and then develop hypothermia. It doesn't take long to die from hypothermia. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, that's unfortunately the case. Bottom line, yeah. in, in many of these cases, a drug or alcohol and drugs or alcohol alone may have caused them to fall asleep or pass out, but it's the cold that killed them. Yeah, the cold that killed them. And, you know, exposure and hypothermia. Uh, again, as you, as you develop hypothermia, your respiratory rate decreases, your metabolic rate decreases, and uh, eventually you uh, will have a cardiac arrest from, you know, hypoxia and not breathing. I assume this is why we haven't gotten the autopsy report yet then, that toxicology is in, but the autopsy is not? Right. Uh, toxicology, you know, they say it takes six to eight weeks, but, you know, if you have a good sample of blood or sometimes they take fluid from the vitreous of the eye, depending, you know, wherever it comes from, uh, this can be done almost immediately. It's a gas chrom chromatography or there's other laboratory tests. Autopsies are a physical examination of the body. And it takes not a, a pathologist, a, a, you know, a period of time right. to do it. They want to be complete. Okay. Thanks. And I wanted to just get your thoughts on what he just said, because we waited for Cassie Cauley's tox report for, I, I don't even know if we, we got them back yet, but they were talking about months. Now, it all depends on who does it and where it's done, correct? It's a jurisdiction. <laughs> if it's a dedicated medical examiner's office with their own lab, they do it. If it's not, they got to ship it out. Sometimes they ship it out to a university, um, sometimes a private uh, contracting lab. And, you know, as you said, it, it usually takes uh, three to six weeks. OK, um, but in this case, he's spot on everything he's saying. I agree 100 percent with. OK, um, you know, um, so there was some questions here in the chat. I just want to answer a couple of them out real quick because they, they were on while point here. It, while you're doing it, Ed, I want to say happy birthday to Richella Pranzo. She she turned 29 today, and you're only 29 once, Richella. So uh, happy birthday to you. Hope you have a great weekend. So Crafty159 asks, Ed, if they checked the men's hair, would it tell if they had taken drugs in the last three months? Yes. Um, your hair grows a specific length uh, every day, and if you had taken drugs – uh, anywhere in there, um, the byproducts and metabolic products of the drug will end up in the hair. Okay. And the hair being segmented, they can count back when they identify the drug initially, they can count back the, the strands, um, the lines in the hair, uh, and then count back it day by day by day until they can't find the drugs anymore. So they can, you know, get a ballpark of when you actually took the drug and how long it's been in your system. Now, another question Lou G asked was, she, um, she said, I thought particular hemorrhaging was only with strangulation. It, no, it's, it's, it's any form of oxygen deprivation. So if you're smothering somebody, if you're strangling somebody, or if your lungs paralyze and you can't, you can't get that. Also, if you get a cholinesterized inhibitor into your body well, um, or any of the what's called the blood chemical agents, which inhi will inhibit um, blood uh, accepting oxygen into the hemoglobin will block the oxygen from getting in there. And then you have cyanosis and the bluing of the skin and the particular hemorrhaging will come with those as well. Um, and I want to go to these super chats because uh, so many people sent in super chats and I want to just uh, acknowledge them. Thank you, Blondie, for the $10 super sticker. Linda, thank you for becoming a member. And Paige, thank you for getting merch. She says, I got my merch and it's awesome. Great quality. Thank you. 
Thank you for that, Paige. And thank you to everybody who buys merch. Christina A. says, I feel like I'm at, I'm in the best crime justice class. Criminal justice I'm class. A criminal justice major. Wow. Yeah. Ed, All right. Look at, look at how Ed smiles right there. Hi, thank you, Christine. High praise indeed. You know, it's funny too that you uh, we had this uh, uh, doctor on because um, <laughs> I've had in my career, I had to investigate uh, several um, anesthesiologists who accidentally killed themselves using their own drugs in the hospital. Oh my gosh. Yeah, they wow. were found in their hospital, uh, uh, I guess, dorm area, um, you know, having succumbed to the drugs they self in injected. Yeah, you know, like when I, when we go for our, uh, uh, the every two, two or three year colonoscopy, we get that white pro profopol, profopol or whatever. It's that drug that Michael Jackson was also using. Um, it's readily available to these guys. And gosh. Mountain Girl 212 sends in a super super chat and she says, is that heard of for three tox reports to get back that fast? Hello. Good to see you and Ed on this. Thank you for that, Mountain Girl. You know, Ed, they were talking six to eight weeks and that was the talk until yesterday. This happened in under three weeks, uh, actually under four weeks. I, I stand corrected. It mm -hmm. was in the between three and four weeks to them to get all three of these tox reports back. Whereas prior to this, they were telling us it's going to be a long haul and you're going to have to wait. Uh, any yeah. thoughts on that, Ed? Well, somebody lit a fire under the labs, but you know this was prioritized, and so they got it back faster than normal. Yeah. Okay, but uh, there was there was another thing that um, I was. Just going to think, I had a thought and I just lost it, but maybe it'll come back to me. But Schmitty, Schmitty sends in a $2. We're going to get to that. Uh, he has checked into a rehab and that was as of January 31st, the last day of the month, I believe he checked into a rehab. We're going to get into that. I promise. Dog mom, thank you for the $2. Empty chair were, where Jordan sat till they passed is the empty chair. We don't know. I don't have that information. I don't think it's out there. I think people are speculating on it, but once this investigation is complete, We'll hear the details of it. Lauren Van Dever sends in a ten dollars. She said, "Dead men tell no tales because they can't say whether or not they knew about the fentanyl or cocaine." My cousin died for uh, from what he thought was pot. It was actually spiced and laced with fentanyl and cocaine. I am so sorry, yeah. uh, Lauren, to hear about that. It, it, it fentanyl just takes one time. It yeah. just takes one time. Could fentanyl be the first time somebody used. Could be the first time somebody used drugs, and boom, mm -hmm. now they're dead. Yeah. Fentanyl has been a crisis and it's a killer and it's killing not only our children and young adults uh, and teenagers, uh, it's killing anybody who comes in contact with it. So if you even just mistakenly come in contact with this stuff, it's a, it's enough to kill you. And we'll get into that in a little bit. Uh, mm -hmm. Schmitty sends in another super chat. She's throwing a pocketbook at us and look at her profile picture. It's me and her at Umberto's when mm -hmm. she came and visited. Uh, since Willis has now entered rehab, might this change things as far as uh, charges against him? The police know more than we do. Of course, yes, we do know that they know more, but we don't know anything about, um, again, they, they put him in handcuffs, and I'm going to show that clip right now. It's only 46 seconds. They put him in handcuffs. They do that just for their own safety and to figure out, look, they have four de dead grown men in the backyard of this guy's home. He knew nothing about it according to what he has said and what's out there. So naturally the police are going to cuff him up and say, wait a minute, we got to figure out what's going on here. Um, I mean, you, you do that in the emergency exception. You're allowed to handcuff somebody until you figure out what's going on. Um, and that's what they did. Uh, Jeff, thank you for your support. Maybe this case won't set Ed's hair on fire. I, I would hope not. I, we, we've had enough of that. Ed's got a nice full head of hair. So <laughs> uh, thank you for becoming a member. All right, we're all caught up on the Super Chats and s things like that. We're going to, just so you know, we're going to take your questions at the back end of the show or in the first half of it. But let's show this. This is the 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 home uh, owner, the renter, the home, the home occupant. Let's call him the occupant of this home. This is him getting recorded by his neighbor across the street. This is uh, you know, a neighbor who was jolted. It was 10 o'clock. He was getting ready to go to bed. He heard lights, sirens. He, heard a, uh, he said he heard a woman screaming. And, of course, that was April, um, Clayton's uh, fiance. She was the one who broke into the basement because she got no answer. Don't forget, Ed, for two days from Sunday night into Monday morning, Monday and all of Tuesday, p people were calling, texting, Facebooking, um, Another woman's um, 
rel- she's a relative of one of the victims. She, her husband went and banged on the store, all with no responses. Well, you remember I told you about Ashton Brady. He was the neighbor who lives right across from Jordan Willis, who just by happenstance looked out at the exact moment that 911 was being called. Ashton, we know now that that was Clayton's fiance that actually discovered those bodies, called 911, and then alerted the authorities. Just walk me through what you saw in that moment. So basically, I was just going uh, turn off all my lights. I was getting ready for bed, locking the doors. I went to lock my front door, and I saw a woman come out of the backyard on her phone. And she looked she looked distressed because she kept looking back towards the house, and I thought it was weird. But I had just moved in, so I really didn't know much. And so I just went back to my room. Ten minutes later, I saw an ambulance drive by, and I said, well, that's just weird. Something's going on. Went to the front front room, looked out, and I saw that there was already three cop cars and there was a man detained and the woman was talking to the other police. And basically I just, I kind of watched that conspire for an hour or two. The man eventually left. Uh, The police searched the house, went through the backyards and everything. And I I had no idea what had happened. And the next morning I saw the news that they had found three dead bodies. And I just was kind of in disbelief. I was like, wow, I watched that happen. Right. And, and actually, we're looking at that video that you shot right there on the top left corner of your screen. So basically, you're saying that's the video where you're actually looking out and you can see Jordan Willis that's, being detained. That's probably within the first five to 10 minutes. I like I was like, oh, my goodness. It looks like him up in the stair, uh, in the, so, um, yeah. the front so your red flags were going off in that moment. But even before that, right, because you saw some of these victims cars that were right here parked in front of your house. And that also kind of alerted you. Right. Because that was unusual. Yeah, we, we had just moved in, but that week we had never seen those cars there. And then all of a sudden that whole weekend, there was uh, cars parked right in front of our drive and they never left. Not, and they stayed there until the police came. And even after that, we found out they're deceased. And but they, yes, those cars never left. And obviously that was something that raised your suspicions at all. Tell me, I know you, you hadn't lived here for very long, right? Uh, but Tell me at all about Jordan Willis, what you know about him. I mean, did you ever see him out and about? Was he friendly? Did he come by and talk to you ever? Honestly, I, I have never seen him out. I never I never saw him or talked to him, so I, I cannot speak for that, honestly. I do not know. How about the fact that just something that is so strange, this case in general is, is bizarre and we don't have many answers, but the fact of the matter is two, I'm sorry, three men were outside for two days on this backyard one sitting up in a chair, two and laying down on their backs, frozen to death. I mean, how do you wrap your your mind around all that information? I, it's a lot, honestly. There's, I imagine it has something to do with a, a bad drug or something. But I, it's it's strange that how long it occurred for people for something to notice like that. If it happened on a Sunday, that's a long time, and I feel like someone should I, something should have been said. I would imagine. Yeah, it's hard to say out loud because you don't have all the information. But the fact of the matter is three men are now dead. Does it feel like you're getting or your community is getting the answers it deserves right now? That seems to be the big issue that the families have is it just doesn't feel like they're getting closure because they're not getting answers. Yeah, I feel for the families and that that they just want to know what really happened. And I feel like we I mean, if if we need to know, we need to know. I'm sure answers are going to come out. But I know a lot of a lot of people are wondering what happened around here. That's for sure. What is the talk of the town? How are people talking about it still? Because no doubt about it, the whole world is looking at this case and talking about it. So how do you and your friends talk about it, process it, work through this whole story? You know, we just kind of sit down and talk about it. Sometimes we're just randomly, we'll be talking about like, like what could have really happened? Like how, how do your three buddies, like, you know, just you not notice them for two days outside in the backyard. So it's, it's really strange for me uh, and all, and all of our friends, I, it's really hard for me to say, but I, I feel like it, it had to have been just I, maybe an accident. I don't know. It's It, it needs more investigation, though, I think. Ashton, hang tight. I think. Uh, Ash- All right. So, um, you know, that was just a little bit from the neighbor across the street. Now, I wanted to just tell you, Ed, um, the victims were discovered on January 9th, 2024, uh, found by uh, Clayton McGinney's um, fiance, April. Ten days later, um, the representative for the police department there in Kansas City Police Department, uh, Captain Jacob Bacina, uh, says that Kansas City Police Department says the next phase of this investigation of this case, they didn't say investigation, is to receive the medical examiner's cause and manner of death and toxic- toxicology reports. Until that time, this is uh, this is not an investigation. They're not investigating. 
this as uh, any type of suspicious um and the statement i wrote it out just to me sounded like well they've they've did what they had to do listen i just want to get from you before we go further i know you you know you're chomping at the bit to get to this next phase of this but i wanted to get from you ed what would be some of the steps like in a case like this you know did a did a legal medical death investigator come out there did crime scene come out there did they do would you want to now seize um, or seal that home off if you get consent from the homeowner go and see if there's any type of chemical lab in there where he's things are being produced like i'm just well, absolutely, me, absolutely is it just me in the chat yeah. chat let us know in the chat if, if, if i'm in going down the wrong path here but ed i, I just want to get it from you yeah absolutely this is a sus suspicious death you have three people dead at one location so automatically the medical examiner or coroner system i don't know what they have here uh probably medical examiners and they um would send their death investigators out. The crime scene people should be out there as well. Okay, um, you know, and as 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 we heard, I believe he gave consent, and the, and the officers searched his um, residence there where you know he's staying, um, and they would be looking, and uh, you know, hopefully they had some protection, some PPE, you know, because if in fact there is this fentanyl there and other drugs, um, you know, they, they can easily succumb to it as well. I mean, I've, I've got case study after case study I can share with the, our chatters, or our, our, our family here about uh, officers accidentally uh, getting exposed to this and then have ending up in the ER uh, fighting for their lives and uh, so forth. Uh, this is no joke. And it should be um, many nations around the world have classified fentanyl and carfentanyl as weapon of mass destruction. And for the life of me, I don't know why the United States government hasn't done the same thing. And once it's been classified as a weapon of mass destruction instead of a uh, narcotic, okay, then, you know, there are a whole lot of things we can do to um, fight its uh, importation and the manufacturers of this, because uh, most of this fentanyl is coming across our southern border into the United States and it's coming from China, yeah. okay? Uh, and we have to, you know, we, we listen. Let's be honest. We haven't, we haven't won the war on drugs. You know, we're losing bad, and a hundred thousand people a year are overdosing on these opioids. Okay, and, uh, so you know, we, you know, a hundred thousand a year, right? And and some statistics say a hundred, a hundred people a day are dying over uh, over these opioids. We have to stop this. Yeah, and, and and any way that we could stop the flow coming in, whether it's coming in from the southern border, whether it's coming in from China, wherever it's coming in from, it's got to be a way to stop it because it's killing our people. And it's killing people, not just in America, it's killing people across the globe. We had an infant baby die in the Bronx in a nursery, right? The nursery was dual use. They had kids and also they were packing fentanyl in the nursery. And the, kid, the, the, the infant that was dropped off by a parent died of the exposure to the fentanyl. Yeah. Look at this te Texas veteran says, that's why I only take Tylenol. Remember we had the Tylenol scare at one point back oh, in, back in the eighties. Eighties. Yeah. yeah. Um, the family finally met with the Platte County prosecutor. And I just want to play this Ed, and then we'll go right to your thing. I promise. Um, Platte County prosecutor had a meeting with them on the 31st and the families f actually felt better. So whatever they discussed with them, they reassured them that they're going to be investigating this case to the fullest. So let's just take a peek at this, and then, Ed, I'll, I'll queue up uh, what we got ready to uh, present to these folks. Face his addiction head on, end quote. Fox but, um, some reassurance from the prosecutor. And listen, folks are saying in the chat, do you think that Jordan's going to be charged? We don't know, but I could just say this. I, just like Ed, we're looking at this just like you guys are with common sense. And there are some things that need to be explained that we might not know in the public eye that may be explained to the investigators. Therefore, they're not placing them under arrest. But also, just so you know, it, he's in a rehab right now. So with these HIPAA laws and everything like that, if he's in a rehab, he's going to be getting um, his treatment there. So until he's done with that treatment, I'm pretty sure that they're not going to be able to go there unless there's something substantial, like something major, uh, and bust in that rehab and drag him out of there and hog tie him and bring him to jail. Yeah. Uh, but if I would, go ahead, Ed. 
I would like to know what's in his system. Okay. Um, does he have the same uh, drugs in his system? Now, it, you know, he was cooperating with the police, but I doubt he gave up a blood sample hair uh, for them or did, but they can do it still to this day. They can still do it with hair, right? If they got a judge, if they had probable cause and got a warrant, they could take his hair. And then we could see if those same three drugs were in his system as well. Um, and they wasn't can hair from anywhere. Right, so if he shaves his head like he yeah. does, my head shaved. They could take it from under your arms. They could take it from your, your, your arms, your legs. Yeah, pubic, any any place. So, um, and that's a fact. Go ahead, Ed. I'm sorry, I didn't. Yeah, wanna... no, I want to answer this question out um, because it's, it, why are hospital ERs using fentanyl since it's so dangerous? Well, you're talking about a pharmaceutical grade fentanyl that is made purposely to treat patients and administered by. Uh, licensed medical professionals, not the same thing as this powdered fentanyl, um, unregulated powdered fentanyl that's coming across our borders or homemade fentanyl. Okay. And we're going to show you that it can actually be made. Okay. Anything else you see in the chat while I get this um, up and ready? Yeah. No, just bring it up. Hold on a second. Let me just get rid of a couple of things. Um, hashtag Ed, hashtag Duty Ron, and guys and girls, if you haven't yet subscribed, please consider subscribing to this community, uh, hitting the thumbs up. That's always helpful on the replay. Um, we appreciate you guys leaving us comments down below in the comment section. And if you're not following us on all things social media, it's just all one word, Duty Ron, uh, on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and also TikTok. All right, Ed, we wanted to start here at the back end, right, with the coin? Yeah. So what are we looking at here? So this is part of the training that I teach um, for the Department of Homeland Security to um, firefighters, police officers, EMS all around the, the country in order to protect themselves um, from exposure to the sea burning, uh, chemical, biological, radiological, nuclear materials, as well as fentanyl. So so again, what is it? It's a, it's a powerful synthetic opioid used for severe pain management in the pharmaceutical grade material, okay? Uh, it's 100 times more potent than morphine. And it's sometimes, as we know from all these famous deaths, mixed with uh, heroin, cocaine, or counterfeit prescription pills like Xanax, okay? It's, it, it's hard to detect, but yes, there are street tests that we can do, color change tests. Um, and that's what the city here in New York is doing by um, giving these out, things out for free so that people can test their drugs before they inject it into themselves or they uh, ingest it, to swallow it, okay, so that they don't actually uh, overdose. Um, hey, I want to know how this comment, Lunchbox Glory, absolutely all of the tech is going to be looked at and all of their social media, all of their emails, all of their text messaging, all of their any type of electronics communications, folks, they're going to look at. They're going to have to look at it just to rule out anything nefarious. Go okay, ahead. so you know, if you see the penny there and you see those two, uh, the several crystals of, of fentanyl right there, so that's as little as uh, two milligrams of fentanyl is lethal. Okay, and that's not even the... Now, if you talk car fentanyl, car fentanyl are thousands of times more lethal than fentanyl. Okay, so even less of the car fentanyl will kill you. And I can show you a video of that as well if you'd, you'd like to see it, but let's move on to the next one. So they kept saying he was a chemist. So if he wanted to make this, this is what he would need to make this, okay? So he would need over-the-counter powder and, and drugs, pure products, um, mixing tools, pill pressers, dyes, containers of the product, He'd need chemical liquids and powders, glass, laboratory glassware, active chemical processes, filters, vacuum flask, and lab notes. Now, he needs to protect himself too. When if if this person is actually making this, okay, uh, they need to protect themselves. They they need PPE for their you know so you don't get it on your skin, you don't inhale it, you don't ingest it, you don't get it in any of your mucous membrane areas, you don't accidentally get it in your eyes, yeah. okay, because it can end up killing the manufacturer. Right. Now, and remember, Jordan Willis is a PhD research scientist studying HIV AIDS uh, drugs. So I'm sure that he is aware of the PPE and all of the um, all the protective measures uh, to do his research. Wouldn't you think, Ed? Yeah. 
Yeah. I mean, sure. I mean, but you don't have to be a PhD chemist or microbiologist or any of these other things to make this stuff. These recipes are on the internet. Anybody can make them. Just like ricin, the the, the the toxin made from castor beans. Yeah. Every year, thousands of knuckleheads in the United States make that and end up getting arrested for it. Okay. Um, so let's look at the chemicals that you would need. Now, if, if the police did a search, they would have seen these things if he was actually making this stuff in his house. Yeah. Okay. Let's uh, go to the next one. Ed, you're getting the, off the chat very scared. Everyone's bunkering down and getting their protective uh, gear on and heading to their uh, pullout shelters. So if you're going to make this, right, and this that's an actual photo to your right of um, from ICE, obtained from ICE, of uh, a basement uh, fentanyl lab actually producing the fentanyl, okay? And look how rudimentary and crude this is. So this is very dangerous because if this aerosolizes and gets into the HVAC system, look at the dust all over the place here, okay? It's on the uh, chair. It's everywhere, right? Um, so oh, God. this is very dangerous. So if you go back and you can see these are the drugs, these are the um, precursors that would be required to um, try to produce this on your own. Okay, uh, many of these things are easily obtained, like vitamin B10 and so forth. And a lot of these things are not, um, you know, on on watch lists, you know, that the federal government is watching to see who's purchasing these things. Yeah, it's pretty scary. Uh, I'll, I'll say that, that how easily uh, readily available this stuff is. And and look at some of these comments. Uh, Angel R. Wow. Um, you know, just Connie. Wow, just people are just blown away by this. Um, um, yeah, and then and then and then N ninety five, as Joey Brooklyn, our good friend, says, uh, that won't help you in a situation like this. Well, actually, it's a particulate, so it 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 could help you very much uh, if it's fit tested properly and worn properly. It could protect you against this powder. Deidre uh, Aponte, Duty Ron Umberto's my favorite Long Island girl. Hey. Welcome, welcome. Uh, where are we going to go from here, Ed? Um, let's show them the, the, the signs in, um, of overdosing to uh, fentanyl and cocaine. Okay, just give me two seconds. Scan the chat. All right, you want to start in the beginning? Can you see what I have up there? Uh, yeah, yeah, that's fine. All right, let me, just get, let me just get it a little bit bigger. Yeah, and let's raise that up. So the yellow part, let's get to the yellow part. Okay. Popeye, zip it. All right, here we go. Okay, so this is a uh, this is the um, fentanyl, the signs of overdose. Well, Oops. it was. Uh, <laughs> okay, I got it. I got it. Okay. So meiosis, or, or in this case, uh, small constricted pinpoint pupils, that's known as meiosis, okay? Uh, falling asleep and or losing consciousness. Uh, slow, weak, or no breathing because it's paralyzing your lungs. Choking or gurgling sounds, right? Because it's paralyzing your muscles. Um, so the, you know, the, the acts that normally occur um, unconsciously uh, by your esophagus and so forth are not working now. Limp body, okay, cold and clammy skin and discolored skin, uh, if you can raise that up a little bit so because the uh, thing is blocking it. Lips, discolored skin, especially the lips and the nails, right? So we some cyanosis, all right? Lack of oxygen turns the skin blue in those areas. Plus, again, in severe cases, petechial hemorrhaging because now you're, you're starving your, your body of oxygen and those tiny little capillaries are going to burst and create particular hemorrhaging how old so is this article that we have here because it says over 150 people die every day from overdoses related to synthetic opioids like fentanyl this is from the cdc and if you go to the website right now you'll find that published there okay um so this is the common signs and symptoms of cocaine overdose okay look at the first one increased body temperature okay Increased heart rate, increased blood pressure, chest pains, nausea, anxiety, 
paranoia, uncomfortable shaking, hallucinations, right? Heart attack. So you're you're like think again, John Belushi, speedballing. You're mixing an opiate with a stimulant, okay? In in the quantity and mixing it with alcohol. Mm. All right. Again, it would be really beneficial if they could find out what Willis has in his system and if it matches what they had. And that explains him being passed out for two days. And he's lucky to be alive because he was indoors as opposed to outdoors. Yeah. What are we looking at here, boss? Okay, folks, you can go to this website. You can go to the DEA website and you can um, get this guide. It's uh, not confidential. And it, it gives you a briefing on um, for, for first responders. Your taxpayer dollars paid for this, by the way. So yeah, you have access to it. And um, it tells you all about uh, fentanyl and how to protect yourself from it and so forth. Ed, this is for you and myself. Uh, C. Cookie says, Duty Ron, hashtag Ed. I want you to know how much I appreciate you taking the time out of your personal lives to teach us and help us understand what is going on with all of these cases. Uh, bless you both. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. C. Cookie, much love and respect. So this hey, Ron? Is yes. If you want, I could, I could actually show that video. Which video is it? Uh, from the DEA. Yeah, if you want, you could share. Right, it. Let me let me uh, see if I can bring see if I can right. work work your let, magic. Let me look at let me look at the chat while you do that. Katina okay. says hashtag at Ed and Duty Ron. So glad you're talking about this and educating people about fentanyl. Listen, fentanyl is again killing Americans and killing people globally across the world. It doesn't. This is not a U.S. problem, USA. This is a problem of the world, and this stuff is killing people all over the place. Uh, and it's happening at an alarming rates. So it's very important that we talk about this. And I'm going to look at some of the super chats while Ed tries to find that. Schmitty threw her whole wallet at us. Um, she's gotten $5 super chats all over the place. Thank you, Schmitty. Love you. Uh, Mo Mo Monique Preciado, she says she's been a member 16 months. She says his drug tolerance was higher than the others. I'm not sure who you're referring to. Maybe she's referring to Willis. Uh, we don't know that. That's just speculation, and it could be possible. It could be possible. Jennifer, right, Ron, you ready? I'm going to try it. I'm going to try it. Indy McDuff, thank you. I bring my own salt and stevia when I'm dining out. There's a lot of homicidal lunatics out there. Sorry for the caps. Uh, we appreciate it. All right. Let's let the audience know what they're watching here, Ed, before you play it. It's a DEA officer safety alert about fentanyl. All right. Let's go full screen with that. Make sure the okay. volume is up. All right. Let me see. Press play. I'm going to play do what you do to me. Come on. Let's go. Come on, Wallace. Press Hold play. on. Let me hide it. Uh, so. Is it playing? Not the not the audio. You just got to undo the. You got to get. You got to share the audio. Okay. Hold on a second. It looks like there's a line through it. Yeah. Um, is that a Chrome screen? Yes. Yeah, you got to share the audio part. So oh no, it's not a screen. It's not. It's just a video on my computer. Uh, so, so you got to share it as a video file, not as a as a window screen. Okay. So let me go back. Screen. I'll stop screen. I'll stop screen. All right. Let me look at the chat. We'll take a minute here to uh, answer some questions in the chat. Hashtag duty run. Hashtag Ed. I'm starting to scroll back, but if you've already put your question in, please put it in again, and I'll try to grab it while Ed fixes that. Um, it's scary what's happening, says Dorothy Foster. Yes, it is scary. Um, again, in the 70s and 80s, people were, you know, there was all kinds of partying going on, and yes, people were dying from drug overdoses. It wasn't out there. We didn't have the internet. We didn't have news coverage the way we have it now. Now everything is out and you see it. It's in your face. So um, it, it, it is really, really bad. Um, hey, Ron, hey, Ron. Yeah. This is an ABC's new, news clip. It's fine. That, is it's that going to be okay? All yeah, right. it'll be all right. Lexi says Popeye's coaching. Yes. Lubbock, Texas. Covered head to toe using oxygen tanks to breathe. 
You would think these officers are about to come in contact with a deadly disease, but this is an alleged illegal drug lab. Us just being here next door and just regular stuff like that and we could have been exposed. Inside, officers are searching for something so lethal and toxic that law enforcement can't afford to take any chances. All of this because they're about to come in contact with fentanyl, a synthetic opioid often mixed with heroin, but up to 40 times more powerful leaving a deadly trail across the country. This heroin overdose is one of more than 80 in just three days around the tri-state. As heroin sweeps across the nation, fentanyl is making it even more dangerous. And now users are taking it in bootleg pill form mixed with God knows what. In 2015, the number of opioid deaths surpassed 30,000, fueled in part by the surge in fentanyl overdoses, far outpacing deaths by gun-related homicides. So toxic that the DEA recently sent out a warning to police around the country with this chilling story. Grab the bag and I closed it up, forcing the air out of it so I get a good seal. And when I did that, a uh, bunch of it poofed up into the air right into our face and we ended up inhaling it. I felt like my body was shutting down. You actually felt like you were dying. And you have to be that careful every day. Yes. I went to a law enforcement laboratory in New Hampshire to see how they're battling the deadly drug. This would be an example of a heroin, a lethal dose of a typical batch of heroin. And then this file would be the typical uh, dose of fentanyl. What I mean, would that's be concerned. Scant, you? you can Correct. barely see it. Prayers to you, Mary. Prayers to you. Strength, positive vibes. Thank you for tuning in. Ed, thank you for sharing that. Oops. Ed Wallace just clicked himself off. Now you got me here full screen um i got a whole bunch of other videos that i want to present to you guys but i i want to i want you guys to um you know in, engage here with us um so if you have questions i'm going to scan again the chat uh and and look for your questions Ed, that was um that was pretty eye-opening um i don't know how long ago that was filmed but looked like an abc nightline special right yeah, I know those two guys. They're from Atlanta County, New Jersey. They're detectives in the narcotics unit. Okay, yeah. so. Um, so, yeah, a lot of people chiming in with their thoughts. Uh, Rochelle says, all planted, all, all planned by China. I mean, look, we all have our thoughts and opinions on this, right? Um, hashtag Ed, uh, did you say opioids were in Xanax? They're mixing it. In bogus Xanax pills. That's what, you know, one of the f pills that he showed you there on the screen in that um, that clip I just showed you was a bogus Xanax pill. Right. If you're not getting it from a bona fide, like Walgreens, you know, legit pharmacy, these pills are being sold on the black market and, and so forth. And, and they're mixed because fentanyl is a cheap substitute to cut up drugs and make them seem like there's more to it they're mixing it with cocaine and mixing it with everything i mean it's just uh you know i don't even know uh, like how parents now like with their younger kids like i didn't even have to have this conversation with my kids as they were growing up but i actually preemptively struck them and said hey somebody's got some kind of white powdery stuff or somebody's introduced i don't care if it's a hot girl or if it's a, your best friend or the most popular guy walk away from it and my kids kind of looked at me like i was crazy and like you know the overprotective dad but they were both athletes in high school and i had to have that conversation with them because i was aware of what was going on around me because of the profession that we're in ed so i had that uncomfortable conversation so as parents you have to do that and look this is afflicting everybody these are grown adults these men some of these guys have children. I, I, I'm, I'm thinking one of these guys I, I was listening to an interview had five kids, four or five kids. So um, they made some poor decisions, uh, possibly. Maybe they didn't. I, we don't know. None of us were there, and none of us can say what happened. But I'm always thinking of the victims' families and the kids and the parents and the grandparents and everybody that's left behind with the unanswered questions. And that's where my empathy comes into play here. I I don't care about how everything happened. I'm caring now about what these families have to go through without any answers. And, you know, it's up to the law enforcement professionals and the lab people to figure this out. And you said it well right up front, Ed. It's going to be the science that uh, solves this. So you know, Look at the damage to the organs, the heart, the, the central nervous system, the brain itself. 
Okay. Um, folks, I just want to give you this, uh, a board of advice. If you have children, you know, t teenage children or, or preteens or whatever the case may be that, you know, and they have been exposed to these drugs. If you see some strange pills in your house and in, in, in associated with your kids, whatever, do yourself a favor. Don't touch it with uh, your bare hands. Um, get, get, get gloves on. Take a look at it. If it's legitimate pills, you know, even the even some of the knockoff pills that have the fentanyl in it are will have some of the same stampings in the pill uh, that you can Google the, the the color of the shape of the pill plus any any letters or numbers that are on the pill and you know like a physician's desktop reference of the medicine will pop up online to tell you what you're potentially looking at or dealing with right. and what and whatever you do too don't flush this stuff down the toilet. No, okay. No. You know, that's not the way you, that's not way, the way you get rid of it. Um, what you could do is, is safely bag it up. Okay. And get it, uh, to, um, to, uh, an emergency room or a hospital, uh, for, for it to, to properly be disposed of. Just look to your town or your, you know, whoever your officials are in your, your county or town or wherever you're residing. And they'll tell you the proper places where you can dispose of, this type of stuff in a safe fashion. Oh. Uh, Beckfest, who's a good friend of the channel, my 10-year-old son knows almost more than I do about fentanyl. It's crazy how it's such a commonly discussed thing amongst kids, young kids. They are terrified of it, and, and they should be. That's good, but sad at the same time at Duty Run. And Beckfest comes on all the time with us. Um, the next thing I wanted to do, before you go to what you're going into, um, Dan Abrams talked about the legal aspect of this thing, and it's just two minutes and 26 seconds, and I think it's worth playing. But, Ed, go ahead. What do you got? What do you see? Well, well, first thing, um, I, I got to bring this up here, a little anecdotal story. Uh, it didn't show. Okay. Mm -hmm. So back in the 90s, BB, I uh, heard that 90% of our paper, paper currency has uh, nose candy on it. How much of this stuff could be uh, – on our currency. It's funny you should say this. All right. So in in um in the course uh, that Ron came and visited um, when I was teaching, I, I have instruments, uh, analytical instruments. One of them is called an ion mobility spectrometer. And it uses thermal absorption. What does that mean? It's got like, think of it as like a little toaster oven. And you, you take a swab off of somebody's hands or their luggage, and it could it look for trace uh, drugs. It could look for explosive. It could look for any number of things, um, narcotics as well. So what I asked my students that what was going through my, um, my instrument uh, workstation, I said, reach into your pocket, um, find me the old, you know, some, some paper dollars, some old money. See what the oldest one you have in your, in your, in your pocket. And they would give me, their money and I would shove that money right into the machine, not swab it, stick it right in. Okay. Mm -hmm. It locks on, it it ramps up heat over one face of the um of the, the bill and pushes and, and vaporizes the particles that are on the bill and pushes it into the instrument to conduct the analysis. Okay. And every dollar that I've ever gotten came back with some kind of drug, whether whether it was meth or it was ketamine or it was uh fentanyl. And then recently I was teaching up at um, Rhode Island. Money is dirty. Yeah. I was teaching up at Rhode Island and we did a practical exercise and we were using a mass spectrometer and it, it has a similar swab system where you swab a surface and then uh, stick it into the unit. The unit locks down, ramps up heat, vaporizes particles and pushes it into the spectrometer. Well, the student, the firefighter, uh, hazmat guy, swabbed the floor of this building and the unit came back positive for fentanyl. Holy shit. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. So there were traces, tiny traces of fentanyl on the floor of this building that we were working in. That's insane. And, and scary at the same time. All right, let's listen to Dan Abrams, Jesse Weber. They discuss the legal aspect of this thing, because I know by a show of hands in the chat, how many of you are interested in, in, in are saying to yourselves, when, is somebody going to be held accountable or if will somebody be held accountable or is this going to just be a tragic, um, a, a tragic drug overdose by three willing participants? And 
to figure all that out, as Ed is keep saying during the course of this, and I'm saying the same thing, the science will tell the tale of what we can't get from the deceased three. So um, let's take a listen to what Dan Abrams and Jesse Weber and um, I believe a criminal defense attorney had to say, because I found this pretty interesting. Now have those toxicology reports and they show fentanyl, cocaine and marijuana in the systems of all three men who died. News Nation is told, and this really comes from the families who met with the police, that the amount of fentanyl is well beyond the lethal limit, not legal limit, lethal limit. Today, the toxicology reports shared with those families. But Ed, you said, and we showed that um, that graphic there, we showed the penny, and there's a little speck next to the penny. So what's lethal um, is, is a very small amount. Right. And so if you take what we showed you there and you multiply it by three, so that's what the family is to- telling News Nation that the police told them that their family loved one had three <laughs> times the, the lethal dose. There you go. Let's let the rest of this play. And, and it's not that much. It's not. It's not a lot at all. Your old Ricky Johnson, 36-year-old Clayton McGinney. 37-year-old David Harrington. After mounting pressure from family and the media, families have been really angry of course. with a lack of answers up to this point. Meanwhile, the living friend, Jordan Willis, was a tenant in the home they'd gone to, has moved out of the house, checked himself into rehab, never contacted the police, despite the men being dead and frozen in his backyard for two days. His family calling the deaths of his friends as a serious wake-up call. They're saying that if this is what led him to go into rehab. After the shocking loss of three of his close friends under extremely tragic circumstances, Jordan recognized he had a problem with addiction. He immediately checked himself into rehab after vacating his home and putting his things into storage. How many of you in the chat feel that that, do you feel like that's like, do you, do you are you buying that? Put a one in the chat if you buy it. Put a two in the chat if you think this is um, the Jordan's response to, oh, shit, I'm in trouble. Let me try to cover my ass. So one, if you believe the story, two, if you don't believe the story, I just want to see. I like to pull the chat. Ed, there's over 2,200 people, maybe 2,300 people. I want to just get the feel for whether the ones outweigh the twos. I'm seeing a lot of twos. I'm seeing a lot of ones. Um, but I'm seeing more twos than ones. That like pe- A lot of people, I think the majority is feeling that he's trying to cover his ass here. And again, opinions, everyone's got one. Um, <laughs> well, you know, this could be his wake up call. You know, he, 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 this, this isn't the first time these, um, men were doing drugs. L- uh, okay. This isn't the first time. Yeah. It wasn't their first go around. Yeah. And, and, um, let's continue with this because I, I have something to say about, uh, whether somebody can be arrested or so forth. Cause my wife used to do this. Go ahead. Okay. Let's let it roll. recognize he had a problem with addiction. He immediately checked himself into rehab after vacating his home and putting his things into storage. Since the beginning of this case, police have said there were no signs of foul play. They were not investigating this as a homicide. And tonight they're just saying the case remains an ongoing death investigation. Joining me now, Jesse Weber, attorney and anchor for the Law and Crime Network, also a News Nation legal contributor. And my friend Mark Iglarsh, criminal defense attorney and former Miami-Dade County prosecutor. All right, so Jesse, now we've got this information about the fentanyl, um, a lethal limit. Where do you think that takes the investigation? So what we don't have is the autopsy report. What I mean by that is we still don't know the exact cause of death or manner of death. It looks like it could be the fentanyl. What we don't know is how they got the fentanyl. We don't know if they knew they ingested fentanyl. So many of the cases we cover are people who are given what they think is some other drug and it's laced with fentanyl. The person who supplied it actually ends up facing criminal charges. Because we don't have those answers here, it then becomes a question of who introduced that into the mix. And remember, they all... Ed, you want to do you want to stop and talk about this? Yeah, he's spot on. That's what my wife used to do. Okay, um, you know they they would see people are told here, and especially in New York City, the heroin addicts that are shooting up. Um, you know, go into a public space like uh, a Burger King parking lot or a fast food restaurant parking lot, whatever the case may be, uh, so that if you OD, people are going to see you passed out in the car uh, relatively easily and, and try to seek help for you, right? So we have many homicides. Uh, well, we they 
they, people died or overdose, right? It, it's it's tip, the ME is not going to classify it as a homicide. Typically, it's they're going to call it an accidental death, or they may give it the dreaded copy causes undetermined pending investigation. What? But what my wife used to do is would grab cell phones and get the data to search for the dealer um, that sold them this, and then identify the dealer and then go out and collar the dealer, arrest the dealer for felony homicide, all right, for selling the drugs to him, and, and which caused his death. So that, that could be here if we could figure out who supplied the drugs. Now, if they voluntarily took it, okay, then their death's going to be ruled as, a, as a, typically it's going to be ruled as an accident. But that doesn't mean that law enforcement can't charge the person that distributed right. the, the, the drugs. There you go. Let's listen to this again. The fentanyl, the person who supplied it, actually, we don't know. It, what I mean by this, we still don't know the exact cause of death or manner of death. It looks like it could be the fentanyl. What we don't know is how they got the fentanyl. We don't know if they knew they ingested fentanyl. So many of the cases we cover are people who are given what they think is some other drug and it's laced with fentanyl. The person who supplied it actually ends up facing criminal charges. Because we don't have those answers yet, it then becomes a question of who introduced that into the mix. And remember, they all died together outside, which is a very eerie circumstance. And we know that Mr. Willis was allegedly passed out. So did they all take it together? That becomes the next question. We definitely have a piece of the puzzle, but now it becomes what do we do with it? But And Jesse raises an important point, Mark, which is whether it was intentional or not, it could be totally unintentional. And yet the person who supplied the fentanyl, whether it's the guy in the house, whether it's somebody else, could be in legal trouble. I know that all too well. My first thought was, with certainty, they're going after whoever might have supplied the drug. I am representing someone currently who was an addict and was using drugs with someone else, and he supplied it to her. She overdoses, and now I'm defending him for felony first-degree murder. So that's the popular charge these days. Let's find out where the drugs came from. Let's go after them and subject that person to a life sentence. Thank you for watching. Go to new. Well, you, you know what, Ed, I, I, as a deterrent, and I don't think it will deter people from distributing drugs, but if they're held accountable, look, look, remember, I don't know if it was a decade or two decades, I, mean, I think it was more than two decades ago, they started this whole thing was if a bartender serves somebody after they're in, visibly inebriated and they continue to serve them, they could be held accountable for um, the actions, whether the person goes in their car and kills somebody and so forth. So it, it's almost on that same um, plane here, yeah. the same playing field, no? Yes, and most of that, though, most of that with the bartenders was civil, but now it's becoming criminal, okay? Right. Um, but, you know, it was. it's funny when we talked about this, I just saw this to pop up um, about in Scotland, Glasgow, they have their first safe place to take drugs. Well, we have that all over the United States. Most of the major cities like in San Francisco, New York, we even give out the needles. OK. Uh, and so they can go to these locations run by uh, city governments and go in there and safely do their drugs um, under, under a watchful eye with Narcam nearby just in case. I mean, it's. I, I, I can't believe it. To, it's, you know. it's, yeah, it's absolutely absurd. And, and you know, they have these safe places, like you said, in New York City, where they can go and they're supplying them with heroin uh, addicts with needles to come in, shoot up, and then leave. Um, mm -hmm. The Kansas City Police Department tonight didn't do a press conference, but did an interview with our um, news affiliate, Malik. Um, I think his uh, I, I don't have his last name, but Malik, uh, who has been doing all these interviews. I'm going to get his name here in this piece. I want to play this because they put out a warning to the community in that area um, that there's a, an inherent danger here because they don't know exactly where the the, the drugs came from that killed these three, I, I believe. Listen to this, because, Ed, I didn't share this with you, but I, I caught this right before we went live, and I saved it. So take a listen to the way Malik Jackson has been doing an unbelievable job. I've seen him on News Nation, but he, for his own station here, Fox 4 Studio, 
uh, Fox 4 in Kansas City. He is doing an unbelievable job covering this case. He's been all over the place interviewing everybody, but he, in, he interviews the police chief of Kansas City Police with that. But I found that interesting that they um, you know, did that in, interview inside police headquarters. And, um, you know, and I just want to say this, too, about these illegal pills that they're being made with fentanyl. I mean, these aren't these aren't high end ph uh, pharmaceutical companies producing these things. So these people, you know, they make a batch of these pills. Some of these pills may have a higher dose of the fentanyl in them than the others. I mean, there's no quality control uh, in place here like you would have at a pharmaceutical manufacturing plant. OK, so it, it is possible, you know, that they, they ran a batch and then like one pill had far less fentanyl in it than than some of the others. So you're, it's hit or miss with these things. But it all it takes is one time. And and now our great friend Jennifer Nobles is in here and she asked a question about how we can um, uh, get help and, and get um, outreach to the schools so the kids are made aware of this and, and stay away from this stuff. Jennifer, um. As you heard from the chief in that interview, um, there, there are outreach programs from the police agencies. Um, there are outreach programs from the prosecutor's offices. And there are outreach programs you can reach out to the DEA. And they will send people out to your schools to, to give um, these kids lectures about this. Yeah. Absolutely. And there those programs and, you know, just go to your local precinct. Um, they'd be more than happy to come in and, and lecture the kids. Um, and, and, you know, school administrators, they're on, most of them are on top of this stuff because I know they did it at my son's high school. I attended uh, some of the, um, some of the lectures. So, you know, if you're not getting it in your school district, make sure you say, you know, tell them that you want, you, you want that. You definitely want education. That's for sure. Um, some people are asking, can you smoke fentanyl? Uh, yeah, if it's laced in a in a in a in a, a marijuana uh, joint, you know, rolled up, hey, absolutely, absolutely. Um, a lot of questions coming through in the chat. Uh, we appreciate everybody. If you're new, let us know. If you're new, by saying new in the chat, and if you are, you know, someone who's been here for a while, let us know where you're watching, city, state, or country. I'd like to see how many people are watching and from where. It's always interesting to see that. Um, we have so much more to cover and to to uh, talk about on this case. We could go live for another two, three days straight uh, talking about this. Um, look at all the new people in the chat, uh, Ed. Yeah, awesome. Thank you for being here. Welcome. Yeah, a lot of a lot of new faces, a lot of new folks. If you're not yet subscribed and you're new, take a chance with us. We are a, a learning channel. We try to educate the best we can from the police detective's perspective. My partner and co-host, Ed Wallace, is a retired crime scene unit investigator and a forensic expert. He worked at the New York City Police Department and also the New York City uh, medical examiner's office in the DNA lab and Ed is t uh, teaching uh, across the country. Let's go to the super chats because they're, they're important as well. Uh, Blondie sends in another $10 just saying, thank you. I appreciate you Blondie. Thank you for being a Patreon supporter and a channel member. Uh, Kim McDonald sends in $10 and says, as a mom of a 16 year old son, I'm terrified that one of his friends may try to amp up the night or get together and slip him something unknowingly, not realizing the potential and causing his death. Yeah, it's a danger that parents now have to deal with. And, and that's, that's, it's a very real possibility, but don't get yourself crazy over it. You just have to educate your son, talk to him, keep talking to him until you're blue in the face uh, and let him know that you love him and you want him to be here. Uh, and not to have a situation where he you know, could put himself uh, in, a, in a bad place. Uh, Rolana, thank you for the $10. Southern Charm, thank you for gifting a membership. Bama Sin, gifted memberships, thank you for doing that. Uh, Paige says, this scares me for my kids and other children following. Yeah, absolutely. Um, Bama Sin says, she's a member nine months, says, I, I have a cougar crush on Ed CSI brain. How about that, Ed? Oh my! Uh, that's that's a compliment, Ed. She's yeah, crushing. yeah. Right. Thank you. Oh, good. Thank you. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I got a question here, um, and I'm not going to even touch that. But anyhow, uh, <laughs> all right. Uh, so Eileen, uh, she's from Australia, down under. I'll be down there in March, uh, young lady. I'll be down there. So the, these are um, 
challenge coin um, flag holders uh, for the various challenge coins that I get uh, in my travels working around the world and um, with training uh, various law enforcement and military and fire departments uh, throughout the nation. And uh, I have currently three, each one of them holds about a hundred coins. And I'm currently on my third one now, and they have um, our NYPD detective shields uh, in the uh, stars uh, area to, to where our flag would have the stars. And one says uh, CSU, the other says Counterterrorism Bureau, CTB, and the other is my wife's uh, Major K Squad. Outstanding. Outstanding. That's a great room. And I, I hope that, we, you know, when you're home, you'll go live from it as much as you can, because it's a it's an awesome setup. And it, let us know in the chat if you like the new setup for Ed Wallace. I, I mean, I've been putting him full screen all night. Uh, but let us know also if you're on the replay down below in the comments what you think of Ed Wallace's new setup with his crime time with duty Ron crime time with Ed Wallace uh, sign. I have my crime time with duty Ron sign in the back. It's flashing. Um, I got to fix my camera so it's uh, focused right on that. Um, listen, we spent about an hour and 30 minutes on this one tonight. This is a difficult case. The victims, David Harrington, 37, Ricky Johnson, 38, Clayton McGinney, 36. And, you know, their families, we got to keep them in the forefront. We got to send them strength, prayers, and positive vibes. And the police, the prosecutor's office, Everyone that um, has a hand in this thing to figure it out, the, um, your, the medical examiner's office, you know, the folks in the lab, and uh, the, we still have to hear about the cause and manner of death. We haven't heard that yet, Ed. Um, so, oh, 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 <laughs> doing my horse act. Okay. Uh, very important because I saw something in the chat. Um, the contents in their stomach will be examined. Right. So, and that will help with the time frame of the the time of death. Okay. So, you know, they're going to look to see what was in that stomach. Now, they're also going to look um, to see uh, what organs were damaged. Um, they're also going to look um, to see if there's any needle marks. Was this an ingested drug or was this an injected drug? Uh, how did this occur? How did it get it into their system? Um, so, yes, that's why that autopsy is is crucial. Very, very important. And also, I, we didn't touch on Alex Lee. Um, that is the fifth individual who came at seven o'clock and left a little bit after midnight. A lot of people are coming at him as well uh, and accusing him of being uh, a potential person who brought the drugs that uh, ultimately um, wound up putting these three guys uh, to their death in the backyard. Um, we don't know anything about him. We know that the police have interviewed him. He has his own attorney. It looks like almost everybody here, the victims included, have attorneys that are representing their families. Uh, and people are doing that to protect their legal rights. Um, we don't know anything about him and what the police are doing behind the scenes. We don't have access to that. And so we're not going to sit here and try to give you guys information. But listen, uh, we put up a poll. Do you buy the story that Jordan Willis um, excuse to go into rehab was his eye opener or it was, um, you know, an excuse for him to get the heat off of him? And um, for those of you who um, participated in that, it was 28 percent said yes. And 72% did not buy that he was going into rehab as an eye opener and that he was going to get himself straight. So uh, an astounding 72%. Now, granted, only 518 people voted in this poll, um, but the no's were 72%. The yes's uh, were 28%. So let us know what you think in the comments and in the, um, in the, uh, in the live chat as well. What do you got up uh, on the screen, Ed? Lindsay Williams, thank you all for covering this. I am from Kansas City, and I thought this case needed more attention. So, again, thanks for your support for the families. Love watching your channel. Right. Thank and, you so much. Yeah, and, and Lindsay, I, I want to say this, and to anybody who lives in that Kansas City, uh, you know, that area, uh, you folks are also a part of this. This is this is a difficult thing because now there's lots lots of unanswered questions like, hey, is this part of – what's circulating in my community. And, and we know that fentanyl is circulating in every community across America. So, um, 
yeah, it's 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 scary. And if anybody is from that local area, hit hit us up on dutyround.com. Let us know what your thoughts are. You know, anything that you want to add to uh, possibly future videos that we do on this, because we're going to continue to cover this case um, from the forensic side and from an investigative standpoint, because we're both retired NYPD uh, police detectives. So we're going to continue to cover this. We're going to continue to speak about this case. And I hope that everybody here enjoyed our coverage tonight. Um, I'm just looking to see quickly. Oh, my gosh. A bunch of super chats came in and we missed it. Uh, Kimberly says, could law enforcement get a search warrant for Jordan's storage unit? That's a good one, Ed. What's your thoughts yeah. on that? Well, they got to have some kind of probable cause. Um, right now, they don't seem to have anything. If they do, um, they can go search the storage, storage unit for uh, illicit uh, lab work, uh, materials, precursor chemicals to make drugs and so forth and so on. Yes, Lane D. Thank you for becoming a member. Uh, Smitty D says, "Do you do we know uh, that Jordan was the only one who supplied uh, the drugs? We don't know if, in fact, he supplied the drugs. We don't know. Um, there's a lot of unanswered questions, and Ed and I are not going to just speculate and say, oh, we think it was him.' Um, there's plenty of people pointing the finger at him. There's plenty of people pointing the finger at the fifth, Alex Lee, uh, and saying that he was the supplier. We don't know." Uh, we don't know. Schmitty uh, sending, well, she's throwing her pocketbook at us again. Ed, your knowledge and comments regarding this scares me. Keep scaring me, though. Very informative and educational. Thank you. Uh, okay. Thank you. Thank you, Schmitty. Uh, so, uh, Curious Kiwi, our, our New Zealand friend, I'm guessing, all right? Ed, can you explain why a lot of people think the drugs come across the border and, and are not produced or grown within the United States? Uh, well, you don't grow fentanyl. Um, the precursor chemicals are being, and the actual finished products are being seized at our border every day by our customs border um, personnel. Um, they they seize millions and millions of tons of, of fentanyl materials. And every day you see these horrific stories. That they seized enough to kill the entire population of the United States. You know, you hear these horrific news stories about these seizures at our border, okay? Um, so yeah, but it can be made. I mean, the pre you can, you, if you get your hands on the precursors, I, I just showed you some of the precursors that you you know, you could oh, use yeah. To, yeah. to make the stuff. Go back and watch the replay. Cause we had it all up on the screen. Um, consistent insomniac, uh, says I've been waiting for you guys to cover this case. It's only a couple of hours for me. Yeah. You know what? We have been following it. It's just that there was not the appropriate, there was there was no appropriate time leading up till tonight for us to really speak about it. Once there was the information about this tox report coming out, then we felt it was time for us to talk about it. Because listen, on this channel, we're not just gonna hit that go live button just because. So we were watching it from a, you know from the background. We were looking at what was going on. Ed and I were keeping track on it and keeping tabs. We felt that tonight for Forensic Friday, even though this was in build as a Forensic Friday, for us to come live with you on Friday night and, and give you guys a good hour and 30 minutes uh, and, and get you up to speed on this case. And and we and I think we did a fantastic job, Ed. Um, and, and I want to, again, thank everybody for being here, all of the new subscribers. Thank you for hitting the thumbs up, Ed, and I appreciate it. The cups of coffee, they just keep coming in, Ed. We should be up all night instead of sleeping, but we do, we have to get our sleep. So, uh, But thank you for supporting us on Patreon, cups of coffee on the Buy Me a Coffee app, the replay viewers, the channel members, the moderators, you guys, we can't say enough good about you. We love you. We respect you. And we, we respect everyone's opinion as long as it's said respectfully, right, Ed? You yes. can challenge us left and right. We love a good challenge. Um, but again, we're going to, we're going to give it to you the way we, from our knowledge base, see it. And it may not always, you may not always agree with it, you know, um, but we're not here to just pat everybody on the back and make everybody happy. We're going to always have this little back and forth. And that's what makes for a good discussion. You so know, we, we you always got to be respectful, agree to disagree. There's no reason to call each other names or, or derogatory terms or, 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 you know, go down into the gutter. There's no reason to do that. You know, I, I've been following the trial up in Connecticut and I see a lot of our subscribers are uh, in the chat up there as well. And I got to tell you though, um, this whole week, I, I, I was flabbergasted at the uh, amount of trash talking 
that was going on in that chat and uh, how it like it went a lot of people went right to the gutter and yes. i was like wow this is toxic i don't want that it goes I, southwest I, I, and and that's what we really have a great appreciation for what we have here because most people for the most part a great great high percentage of the people are very respectful um, and, and all the new people that come in, thank God, we have a, a great deal of high percentage of the new people are just like, wow, this is refreshing. We want to hang out here and we want to learn. So it's always great to, to you know, get challenged. But again, if you're not going to challenge us in a respectful way, then there's, you know, we're going to show you the door. That's how it goes. All right. Um, Ed, I think we, I think we're done. Uh, wait a minute. Just when you think we're done. Beamer but wait, there's Beamer. more. Beamer 650 is here and we always appreciate you. Thank you for being here and her sister, Lexi. Um, Sherry Davis sends in a super chat. Uh, question, 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 question. And Ed, 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 Ed. Duty run, duty run. May be a long shot. Crazy question. Could the drugs have been in the food and the victims didn't know? Okay. Contents of the stomach. Well, I mean, what what would the intent be to kill these people purposely or to um, injure them? What well, I mean, and, and who would have motive to to um, poison their food uh, in that manner? And why would they want to do that? Right? You you'd have to look at all the people, all the players involved, all the people there, and their backstories, and and start looking at their interactions and what's going on here. I think if we follow Occam's razor, meaning uh, basically, uh, all things being equal, the simplest of explanations tends to be the truth. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and hopefully the people who watch the replay listen to that because that is right on. That's spot on, Ed. Um, so, friends, this has been another episode of Crime Time with Duty Ron and Ed Wallace. If you like what you saw here tonight, if you like what we have uh, going on on this channel, Give us a chance. Uh, subscribe. Uh, it's free. It doesn't cost you anything. If you want to become a member or support in different ways, it's always just an option. You don't have to do it. If you let the videos play and you let the ads run, you're supporting us for free. So thank you for all that you guys do here. I am going to end this. And Ed, I know you got something to say. I'll leave it up to you for the last. Um, prayers, strength, and positive vibes go out to all the folks uh, who are left, the families of these victims, the children of these victims. And those little ones are the real, real victims. They don't know how to process this stuff. So we're sending them strength, prayers, and positive vibes. The prosecutors, the investigators, the lab workers, the folks in the medical examiner's office that are going to help to get the science, the computer crimes experts, and everybody that's doing forensic analysis. Um, so, and I want to thank you all and the community from this area for being um, great, great uh, human beings and supporting the men and women in law enforcement. Ed, I know you got something to say. Well, first, I want to say happy birthday to Richella, and I hope Lieutenant Pete took care of you. And, uh, and thank you for okay. all of you being here and sharing your valuable time with us. And please, folks, always stay safe, stay prepared, and watch your six. Good night from New York. God bless, and we'll see you soon. Peace.